Philadelphia for Comic-Con. She's a big Doctor Who fan, so talk to her about haptics, maybe also Doctor Who. Um, at, here at Penn, she's made a big impact in the advancing women in engineering sphere, and also a big impact on me personally, as I am a junior member of her lab. And as you can tell, she's taught me many things, even how to dress. We're accidentally matching. So here's Heather. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Naomi, and thank you all for coming out today. I'm really excited to talk to you about my research in haptics. So I want you to start by thinking back to elementary school when you learned all about your five senses. So sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. So you probably learned a lot about your sense of sight and your sense of hearing, and if you're in robotics, and people in robotics who are doing a lot of vision work focus a lot on the sense of, on your vision, sense of sight. However, the sense of touch is really underappreciated. And all of my work is in understanding the sense of touch and how we can um, use that sense of touch to create realistic virtual environments. So um, in your everyday life, you use your sense of touch to complete a wide variety of tasks. For example, building objects, comparing the tactile qualities of fabrics, if you're doing something crafty, for example, painting pottery, or even playing with your pets. All of these involve the sense of touch and give you a really rich um, impression of the world around you. However, in virtual world, you're expected to interact with computers through a mouse and a keyboard. Recently, there have been touch screens which allow you to interact with things directly on the screen, move things, cut the rope here, but you can't feel anything. Like, I can't feel whether I've actually completed the task of cutting the rope. I can't feel what any of the objects feel like on the screen. And so my research is focusing in haptics. So how can we take what we know about the sense of touch in the world around us and transfer that into the virtual domain? So I'm not interested in just adding, allowing you to feel things through a computer. I want you to feel things that feel realistic, that feel the same as the objects that you would feel in, your virt in the uh, real world. So we use a uh, method called haptography, which is haptic photography, which allows us to take a haptic snapshot of interesting interactions with objects in the real world, transfer those sensations to the virtual world. Um, so one potential application for this, one potential motivation, is in um, museums. So here, this is a museum in Houston, Texas, and they have a piece of dinosaur skin that allows you to feel what the dinosaur actually felt like. But this is really only a small piece of skin. I want to feel the entire dinosaur. And, but we can't do that. It's behind the velvet rope. It says, do not touch. So what if we could learn how to record what this object, what this dinosaur feels like, to create a virtual version that you could feel in an interactive museum exhibit, or that you could feel um, in classrooms around the world and you didn't actually have to go to the museum. So first, let me begin with a brief introduction of the sense of touch. So you have these um, four main types of sensors in your hand. And they all uh, measure a different part of the sense of touch. So you have the Merkel discs, which give you um, spatial discontinuities, the Ruffini organs, which give you um, impressions of skin stretch, the Meisner corpuscles, which uh, allow you to sense edges and um, rate of skin deformation. For example, if you're touching Braille and reading Braille, and Pacinian corpuscles, which allow you to feel vibrations. And so all of these sensors together read in the signals um, of when you're actually touching the objects in the real world, your brain interprets these signals and gives you an impression of the objects that you're touching. And so these sensors both work if you're touching objects with a bare finger or with a tool. And in my work, we focus on um, touching objects with a tool, which may seem a little bit counterintuitive to begin with, but people actually touch objects and interact with objects through tools quite frequently. So one example is here in archaeology, trying to determine what part is a fossil and what part is dirt using tools. 
And so in this interaction, like most interactions through a tool, um, the touching the, uh, touching the real surface and dragging across surface creates vibrations in the tool when the tool hits all the little surface features and all the little bumps. So it's these vibrations that provide you a sense of what the, uh, what the surface feels like or what the object feels like. So these vibrations are the, fo uh, modeling these vibrations are, is the focus of my research. So first, so how do we, how do we measure these vibrations? So we want to be able to um, record what these vibrations actually feel like. So we take some sensors that have been made popular with cell phones. So if you all know, your cell phone has a sensor that allows you to rotate from an image shown like this um, to portrait mode. And that is done through an accelerometer. And accelerometers in the cell phone typically measure just gravity. But here we can use the accelerometers to measure higher frequencies of the vibrations. And so we can take accelerometer, attach it to a tool, and measure the uh, vibrations in the tool when you um, touch the real surface. So this is an example of vibrations that's um, induced from taking a tool and dragging it across a, um, across a material, across a really bumpy piece of plastic. Uh, but these vibrations are not constant depending on how you interact with the surface. If you press harder on the surface, the vibrations change. If you move faster or slower, the vibrations change. And if you vary both force and speed, you get this wide range of vibrations. And so we need to really capture this, uh, um, this uh, multidimensionality of the data. And to do that, I've created this recording device which has sensors to measure accelerations as well as forces that are applied and a position sensor to measure the speed at which you move. And so this is an example of recording data. So you can see how the acceleration signal changes based on the um, forces and speeds that I use when actually recording the data. So you get a data set that looks like this. This is 10 seconds of dragging across the surface. And we measure the acceleration signal as a function of the speeds I used and the forces I used. So if you see, if you look at the acceleration signal here, you can see the amplitude of the accelerations change a lot. Uh, but it's not just the, the amplitude. It's also the frequency content of the signal. So all of this has to be captured as a function of these input conditions. So we take the acceleration signal and create mathematical models of the signal based on, um, two, based on the two main inputs. And after we have a model, we want to play it back to, uh, we want to be able to play these vibrations to a person in a virtual environment. And display, vibration displays that you're probably most familiar with are the ones in your cell phones. And so these are done with eccentric mass motors and they provide a sense of vibration, but they really only um, have one frequency. So you can't get the range of frequencies and you can't get the, um, the type of sensations that we would want out of this type of motor. So instead we use a voice coil actuator, which kind of, it works like a speaker, except it outputs vibrations instead of sounds. So it has an electromagnetic coil with a permanent magnet that's suspended in the middle. We take the signal that we want to output, we can drive the, um, we can send it through the coil to create an electromagnetic field which then moves the magnet back and forth. And this magnet has a pretty high mass compared to the rest of the actuator, so it can out, it like shakes the whole, de uh, whole device and can output the vibrations to the user when we attach it to a tool such as this stylus. So using the um, texture models that I've created and this type of actuator, uh, we have put it on a tablet system which um, allows you to touch the virtual object and the, um, the virtual surface and the real surface. And I don't know if you can hear the vibrations. Is that coming through? Sound? Okay. So um, let me play that again. And so I want you to notice similarities between vibrations from touching virtual.
and touching the real. And so unfortunately, the best way for you guys to try this is to actually feel it, but unfortunately in this type of sitting, you can't, you can't feel it, so you have to rely on your auditory, uh, your auditory um, judgments. So that allows us to feel um, two-dimensional surfaces. But I'm not, I'm not satisfied with just that. I want to be able to really reach into the computer and touch three-dimensional objects. So how can we do, how can we allow you to touch three-dimensional objects, three-dimensional virtual objects? Well, we can use this um, type of haptic device, which outputs, um, which work, look, uh, sorry, it works a lot like a mouse. So a mouse, you can move a cursor on a screen in X and Y, you can move it in two dimensions. And using this haptic device, it's a pen on a robotic arm, you're, allowed, you're able to control a cursor in three dimensions on the screen. So you can actually move into, move into and around a 3D virtual environment. But unlike the mouse, the haptic device is capable of outputting forces to you. And so there's motors inside the device um, that are linked up to cables to the uh, pen of the device. And these, uh, these cables apply a force to you when you're touching the virtual object. And so if we look at the mechanics of touching a real object, for example, a, a sphere, when you press on the object, the object presses back on you. So we need to do the same thing in the virtual world. If I, if I when I'm controlling the cursor, I'm touching a virtual object and I'm pressing into the virtual object, the virtual object needs to press back on me. Um, and we can do, and that can be done through the motors of the Omni, and the same with friction. So if you, take, if you then um, drag the tool around the sphere, you're going to get a friction that impedes the motion. And this friction can also be output through the motors of that haptic device. Um, and then if we wanted to add the textures to a three-dimensional object, it's really easy. We just it's really simple texture mapping. We only need the um, forces and speeds that you're currently applying to the virtual object. It doesn't depend on position, which is a really big, um, which is something that's really good about this type of texture modeling. And so when we add, if we want to feel the virtual version of a textured sphere, we need to be able to output those vibrations. And the motors of the, of the haptic device have too much backlash, too much friction in the motors. And so you, you can't really display the vibrations all that well through the motors of the haptic device. Instead, you need to add that same force coil actuator to the tip of the haptic device, and then that can output, or output the vibrations um, in addition to the normal force and the friction force that the haptic device is outputting. And so using um, this haptic device, we can map a variety of different textures to a sphere. So really bumpy plastic, we can add fabrics such as denim, something probably familiar with carbon fiber. We can even have wacky textures like a piece of artificial grass. And so it, I hope in my research, I've shown you that uh, this has really good promise to go from being able to touch just one small part in a museum exhibit to being able to touch everything in the museum. Uh, thank you, and I'd like to take your questions. Thanks, Heather. Uh, questions from the executive judge panel? Yeah, I just have one quick question. So in going from the 2D to the 3D models, mm -hmm. what did you have to change in terms of your mathematical modeling? Uh, from 2D to 3D? Yeah. Um, the actual texture modeling is the same because the output of the texture model only depends on the forces that the person is applying and the speed at which they're moving. Measurements that you can get out of the code from the haptic device, from the drivers of the haptic device. Um, we're focusing only on isotropic textures, so textures that are the same in every direction. And so the textures that are map mapped here do not depend on position or direction of motion. But if we were to change um, 
add textures that were like a piece of corduroy, um, that would be a little bit trickier to add to three-dimensional objects. Maybe starting with a comment, um, I was really impressed by that dinosaur skin. I assume it's fossilized, right? Uh -huh. So it has yes. no compliance associated with it. I think one of the neat things about your technique is that you could synthetically include this kind of compliance and friction that might not otherwise be available on the dinosaur fossil. Oh, yes, definitely. You mean like when creating the vir uh, virtual piece of dinosaur skin, like adding the, um, adding like compliance to the virtual surface? Exactly. Yeah, I never thought about that, but that is a great extension of the work. Thank I you. I just think it's a neat selling point because you can say, you know, we can make into reality things that you couldn't otherwise access via this technology. Um, the one question I did have is, sorry, I'm feeding back quite a bit. I was gonna talk about it here. Um, well, a lot of your motivations were games because they're, it seems like they're very relatable for a broad audience. Um, but in particular, does this have any applications for uh, teleoperated uh, surgical devices? Is, is there any sense that this could improve uh, the accuracy of these robotic Of teleoperated? Yeah. Um, so definitely there has been some work uh, that's being done in our lab with the uh, Da Vinci surgical robot. And so it's the same type of sensors, the accelerometers, which allow you to measure transient contacts of the robotic device during the surgery. So when the tools collide or when you're um, suturing or you break a suture, like those are the types of things that you can measure with accelerometers and have been done in our lab. Um, what's taken out is the middle step of the modeling. You go straight from the um, measuring to playing instead of the measure model and then synthesize. So it's, a, it's similar sensors and similar actuators, but the, um, the, uh, the path from A to B is a little bit different. And so for instance, uh, a surgeon right now performing a teleoperated procedure, mm -hmm. um, if they were dragging a scalpel across the skin, they would feel some kind of frictional response? Yes. Okay. Well, actually, um, with not with not with the current device that's done in the uh, not with the current device that's done in the lab, the Da Vinci robot has has the surgeon sit at a master console, and then has these robotic arms. And the holy grail of um, haptic feedback for robotic surgery is force, but there's a lot of limitations with the type of sensors and how that is played and how that is played back. Um, but there's a lot of research in that direction currently. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one question from the audience. Um, in the back. Oh, well, dentistry is definitely a very um, important application. Um, there has, again, there has been some work that's been done in our lab with the Penn Dental School about um, recording what you feel when you, uh, the actual stick, the vibrations caused by the stick of the tool in a cavity, um, and trying to teach medical or dental students to recognize that, key, that cue as meaning a cavity. Um, another potential application is um, in training for epidural simulators. Um, so right now, epidural simulators are being done with just force feedback, um, but the different layers of tissue that you have to go through uh, to give the actual, to get into the epidural space, uh, to give the injection, they all feel different. One feels crunchy, one feels really tough, and that's not really captured um, with, current, uh, with the current techniques, but is something that could be done with a similar uh, data-driven approach. Um, I think I saw one other hand, but we're at time for questions. You can so find me after grab at Grab Heather dinner. at the happy hour. But for now, let's thank Heather. And I'll move on to introducing our next speaker.